Lovely. Okay. So I'm going to uh, allow Michael to introduce himself and then we're going to move forward with our. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Michael Hoffman. I'm a principal investigator at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center here in Toronto, and I'm also a um, assistant professor in the Department of Medical Biophysics at the University of Toronto. So today, I'm going to st talk to you guys about analysis of transcription factor binding sites, uh, predicting transcription factor binding sites, and a lot of things around transcription factor binding motif. Um, so my background in this area, um, I did a lot of work on uh, transcription factor binding prediction during my PhD. Um, and during my postdoc, um, I, spent, I spent most of my postdoc looking at epigenomic um, data sets like ChIP-seq, RNA-seq, things like that. Um, and transcription factor binding is, again, becoming a focus of my lab. Get, bear with me for one second. OK. We're going to talk about uh, several things here today. Um, first, I'm going to give you an overview of eukaryotic transcription. Um, then we're going to talk about how to predict transcription factor binding sites using binding profiles. Then we'll talk about detecting novel transcription factor binding sites and how to identify uh, transcription factor binding sites in sets of co-expressed genes or chip regions that you've talked about before. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about gene regulatory networks. If any of you have any questions at any point during this, this lecture, please feel free to, to raise your hand and we can get right to it right there. So starting with transcription and eukaryotes. So this is a very um, simplified, nothing is showing up for you guys. Okay. There we go. This is the overview. It's also in your binder. There you go. Okay, so uh, starting with transcription. Um, so this is a very um, oversimplified view of what transcription is. Um, so it's a, a very simple model. This is a three-step process where a transcription factor binds to a binding site. The transcription factor catalyzes recruitment of the uh, RNA polymerase II complex, and then that causes the production of RNA from the transcription start site. All right, so here is a, a slightly more complex version of this. So um, describing all of the parts that go into transcription. Um, so you can see here the transcription start site that you probably have all heard of and, and uh, loved before. Um, so as it turns out, this idea of a transcription start site can sometimes be a misnomer. Sometimes it can really be a transcription start region. So for certain sorts of, of genes, often the transcription start site will vary over hundreds of base pairs um, upstream or downstream of where you have a TSS marked in, um, in an annotation. So the TSS, um, or the transcription start region begins the first exon of a protein coding, protein coding gene. Um, and you have other exons uh, that will be downstream of it. Um, and the other things that are important to consider are all these regulatory regions. So there's this core promoter slash initiator region, which is very important. And uh, many genes, this contains a, uh, the so-called Tata box. Um, which is bound by Tata binding protein, or TBP. Now, for a lot of genes, this was a very convenient uh, mechanism very, to describe eukaryotic transcription initiation. As it turns out, a good proportion of genes do not actually have a Tata box and use a, a different mechanism to initiate transcription. There are also various regulatory regions. So here we have a proximal regulatory region which consists of a number of transcription factor binding sites. And you can also have distal regulatory regions. So they can either be intronic regulatory regions, but sometimes between 
you know, the first and second exon, you can you can actually um, have regulatory region like transcription factor binding sites that affect the transcription levels of this particular gene. You can also have them at a much, you know, much more distal range as well. So you can get enhancers, and the enhancers can either be in energetic regions far away. Um, they can be in energetic regions a little closer. They can be in the intron, either of this gene or of, of some other gene. So the important thing to, to consider is that, you know, we look at, we usually analyze all of this stuff with sort of a one-dimensional map, but really what's going on inside the cell is something that's three-dimensional. And you will find that the chromatin loops around itself in three dimensions, and that means that something that seems really distal, like this enhancer right here, um, can actually be pretty close in three-dimensional space to where the promoter is. And these things can be linked together by a number of proteins, by co-activators, by other transcription factors, um, and so on and so forth. So it can get really complex. Um, there's a lot of data that we can use to try to um, decipher this, this complexity. Um, so the first, first sort of data that's interesting is there's, there's data on where the five prime ends of the genes are. So there's CAGE data, which stands for CAP Analysis Gene Expression. Did any of you guys see the Phantom, uh, Phantom 5 results within the last couple of months? So this is, some, this is an effort by... Riken, which is a uh, Japanese Japanese research center, to do lots and lots of cage analysis of literally hundreds of human cell types. So if you start finding yourself interested in cage data, that's a good resource for this sort of thing. So there's also a lot of chip seek data. So chip seek data can, can generally fall into one of two categories. It can tell you where epigenetic marks are, so things like histone modifications. Um, and it can also tell you um, where, in this case, where RNA polymerase 2 itself is located. So it can tell you both that as well as where transcription factors are located and transcription factor binding sites and where various proteins like transcription factors, coactivators, and so on are found in regulatory regions as well. All right. So in order to get at this um, laboratory data, um, there are a variety of, of resources that are, that are very useful. Probably the most helpful one is the, the UCSC Genome Browser. Um, do you guys, how many here have used the UCSC Genome Browser before? Okay, good, lots of people. Uh, lots of people haven't used it as well. So um, during the lab, you'll get you know, some experience with downloading files from the Genome Browser. There's also um, GEO. Um, which is a project of, of NCBI. And GEO forms an official depository for a lot of regulation and expression data of this type. Um, it's not always super easy to use, unfortunately. So I think it's really important that when people publish papers, their data be deposited in GEO. But often, if there's another way of getting at that data, uh, you will be better off using that means. Uh, like if the, the PIs have a website or if they're part of some consortium that has some other website. So I'll give two examples of that. Uh, one is the ENCODE project, which was a huge effort to try to figure out as much as we could about which transcription factors occurred at different places in the human genome and different um, cell types, also in the mouse genome. And there's also MOD ENCODE, which did the same thing for Drosophila and for C. elegans. Um, the ENCODE project, all of the data is deposited in NGEO, but if you actually want to use any of it, you're much better off going to encodeproject.org, which will, in fact, redirect you to the UCSC Genome Browser for certain things. Um, Roadmap Epigenomics is a, a similar project in some ways to ENCODE, um, except that it focuses on primary tissues rather than uh, tractable uh, cancer cell lines. And also, Oregano um, is a, a interesting resource that has lots of information about what sort of regulatory elements you can find in various places. 
So to sum up this part of the, sum up, I thought there was a summary here. No, there's not. Um, so move on here to the second part in a second. Uh, does anyone have any questions about the first part of this lecture? Okay, fairly straightforward stuff. So part two, this Camtasia thing drives me nuts. Um, so part two is a prediction of transcription factor binding sites. So, you know, we know where transcription factor binding sites are in some cases, but how can we teach a computer how to find more of them? So um, there are a variety of ways of representing a transcription factor binding site. The one is we might have a single site and we've identified with chip or we've done uh, some sort of other more specific assay um, that a single site is somewhere where a transcription factor binds. So let's say we found the single site AAGTTATGA. The thing about transcription factor binding is that it is extremely degenerate. So you aren't, you know, you're very rarely going to have a transcription factor that binds to a single set string of nucleotides and nothing else. So there will be a little variation allowed at various places in the transcription factor binding site. So here's an example right here, which is that you have um, all of these all of these different binding sites. And you can see some amount of similarity. For example, there's an often A in the second column. There's almost always a T in the fourth column and the fifth column and so on. You can represent this by a set of sites um, using using a special what's called the IUPAC ambiguous DNA alphabet. Have you guys have you guys seen these sorts of characters used to describe DNA before? Yes, everyone. Okay. So um, even if you don't think you have, you know, you probably have in that, you know, N is part of this alphabet that means A, C, G, or T. And you can have things like R, which mean um, A or G, or, or Y, which mean um, C or T, and so on. And there's a whole set of, of codes that are possible there. Um, that is also a bit of a blunt instrument, you know, because really, at some point, you're, you're forced to say, you know, for a particular column in this sort of analysis, um, does this happen? all the time, or, you know, is it split 50-50? Well, what if you have a case where almost all of the time um, it's A, but a few times it's G, and a few times it's C? Do you really want to represent that as V, which is the code for not T? There's more information in there, and we want to be able to represent that as well. So um, the representation people go to instead is called a position frequency matrix. In this case, here's the PSM that people have made from this set of binding sites. And you can quite simply, for each column, add up the number of times you see each one of these characters. So you find A 14 times, 3 times, 4 times here, et cetera, and so on. Um, and by using a PSM, you can find, uh, you can convert a PSM into something like this this sequence logo, which I imagine some of you have seen as well. So this sequence logo is a representation of the transcription factor binding site that includes the information about, you know, which sites are, are you know, more constrained or less constrained, which sites permit some amount of variation, and so on. The, the way we actually represent these PFMs for, um, for computational tools that will identify transcription factor binding sites is with a slight change. So we convert them to what's known as a position-specific scoring matrix, the PSSM, or frequently people call these a position weight matrix, or PWM instead. So to get one of those, you start with the, with the PFM, and you have to correct for the nucleotide frequencies in the genome. So you can do that in this case. We'll start with the PFM, which is this, this F, FBI 
uh, quantity right here. So for every cell in this matrix, we've got an, an F, the B is the base, the I is the column. All right, and we can take that base, and each base has a background frequency um, in the genome. So if you're working in a species that has a really high GC content, uh, your background frequencies are going to be different. You're going to find many more Cs and Gs and fewer As and Ts. Um, if you're working with a very AT-rich genome sequence, then you'll, you'll find the opposite. So having a, an, a, um, an effective background model can be very important if you're trying to discriminate between the sorts of things that have been established by evolution and the sorts of things that are just likely to occur by chance. Finally, we have um, a weight for the, the confidence or the, um, the depth in the pattern. And the way we do this here is by adding a, a pseudo count. All right. You guys see all of these zeros in the matrix. Um, who knows what happens when you try to take log zero? Anyone? Okay. So if you try to take log zero, um, you get um, you get negative infinity, uh, which won't work very well here. So the the most common way of dealing with this is by adding something called a pseudo count. So we actually add one to everything we have here, um, or you can add different numbers of pseudo counts. Um, what the pseudo count will do is it will form essentially a prior on on your model of how uh, transcription factors bind to particular regions of DNA. So if you have a prior that says that everything is one, that's a, that's that you add one pseudo count. That's a very weak prior um, that says that you know if you have more evidence. So if I have that one added everywhere, and then I have you know, 50 counts, they're totally going to overwhelm the one. But if I have a very small number of counts, if I'm only making this inference about the transcription factor binding site motif from, say, five examples, like we are here, um, it'll make a much bigger difference because, you know, one-sixth of the count in each column is going to, well, actually more than one-sixth, so four out of nine of uh, the counts in the column are going to come from the pseudo count. Um, so it's really, you know, how you set up the pseudo count versus how you take the actual data can affect in a big way um, how stringent your your model is and how willing it will be to accept any sort of variation or um, degeneracy in the model. Um, and the final thing that's done is that we take the that we take the log of this probability. So this is kind of an optional step. Um, you will find a lot of descriptions of, of position weight matrices in the literature where people don't actually do this. So they just do the um, frequency and divide it by the, the background frequency. And as long as things are probabilities, then things work well as the PWM. When people say PSSM, uh, usually they mean something that's been log transformed. And the nice thing about log transformation is that when you're scoring things, you just have to add them up, and it's easier for the computer. You don't have to do a multiplication. Yeah, question. The weight is usually multiplicative. The motivation behind adding it. OK, so what's happening here? Um, so that's a, that's a good question. Um, so the important thing to consider is this, this S represents the, the pseudo count. And in most cases, that's going to be a constant across the whole matrix. So it's not really, you know, it's less like a, um, a weighting of this, and it's more like a de-weighting of that. So the bigger the amount of S that you add in, the less you care about the actual data that is represented in an F. Uh, does that answer your question? Okay. All right. So in the end, we have this, this very nice DSSM, and you can see how you can score um, a particular DNA sequence. So here we're going to score the sequence TGCTG. All you have to do is, is add up minus 1.7, 1.0, 0.5, minus 0.2, and 1.3, and you get 0.9. So if we did all of this in the, the linear space instead of the log space, um, you would have had to multiply a number of fractions by each other.
Um, I don't think it's something that anyone, you know, I certainly would not be able to do it in my head. And the thing to remember is even though computers are fast at multiplying, they're even better at adding than they are at multiplying, just like us. So it's, it's uh, helpful for computational reasons to do it this way. All right. So I can show here an example of a particular transcription factor binding site. So this is the motif for the SP1 transcription factor. Okay. The sequence logo looks like this. All right. And here you can see um, the sorts of uh, for, for a real transcription factor binding site, what the PSSM will look like. So look here in the third column, we have this really big G with almost two bits of information. So what you see is that if there's a G in a particular sequence, you add two to the score, and if there's anything else, you subtract 1.5. You see the same sort of thing over here. Whereas if you go to column eight, all right, G is still... Um, the score, you get 1.5 for that, but other things do not improve the score as much. They, they certainly won't decrease the score as much as you have here. So what's in gray in this particular panel shows the score that would be produced by the sequence in the, in the blue box using the SP1 PSSM. All right. You get absolute score of 13.4. Um, there are other ways of, of doing the score. So um, one is you can do a you can do a relative score, right, where you take the maximum the maximum possible score, um, and you take the minimum possible score, and you use those to to set up um, you know. The, essentially a model of what the best and worst possible case for a sequence binding to that transcription factor is. All right, and then you take the absolute raw score minus the min score and divide by this, and you get a percentage in the end. So you can see that this particular sequence has a 93% relative score. Right. You can also um, use methods to convert this sort of thing into a p-value, um, which can can also be um, very useful. People often like looking at this sort of thing. Um, and to do that, you'll look at all of the possible scores and just see what percentage um, have a higher score than um, than what you than what you've actually determined if your raw score. So a lot of the work in uh, making transcription factor uh, binding site. Uh, motifs has already been done for you. Um, so there's a great database called called Jasper, uh, which you can find at this URL, jasper.genereg.net. Um, so Jasper, the people in Jasper have collected data from publications, from direct submission, um, from looking at ChIP-seq data sets, um, and have generated this huge database of PFMs and PSSMs, and you can download those and use them for your own analyses. Um, or if you're using things like Meme, it will usually be like a drop-down. Uh, if you're using like Meme on the web, you can use a drop-down option to just pick the Jasper motifs. And so it's really easy to scan um, your stuff against you know your sequences against these known motifs, and you can identify potential binding sites that way. All right. So let's talk about a, a few of the um, conclusions we should we should make when looking at the history of transcription factor binding prediction um, and some experimental validation. So in the late 90s, so I think people have been developing models like this um, since the since the 80s. Um, I think the first the first one of the first papers I, kn I knew of is from 1986. And in the 90s, people said, let's let's test some of these models. You know, they were getting more high-throughput techniques than they had then. Certainly not the high-throughput techniques of 2014, but they were able to do, you know, some tests within the laboratory. Um, and, for example, in this paper, Trunch found that binding sites predicted with these sorts of methods, 96% of the binding sites were bound. Right? And Gary Stormo... Um, and colleagues found 
um, that transcription factor uh, binding matrices, uh, these position weight matrices, um, fit very well with a biophysical model of how proteins and, and DNA interact. Um, so it seems like you know these are very these models are very good at finding these sites. If you if you have a site, uh, a real site, there's a very good percent, very good uh, chance that one of these models could predict it. The bad is that there are also lots of other sites that these models will predict. All right, so you can find that some profiles will predict that they are transcription factor binding sites. Um, you know, every 500 base pairs of sequence or so. You know, this will depend a lot on the information content of the motif. So how tall those, and the sequence logo, how tall all the letters are, how many columns there are, et cetera. But for some simple motifs, you can find stuff like this. So you might find 20 sites per gene. You know, is this, is this really realistic? Perhaps not. Um, and here is, you know, a case where you looked at a set of profiles on the human um, alpha actin gene, right, and you find that there are transcription factor binding sites all over the place. So if this were representative of, of reality, that would mean that basically the entire um, length of this gene and its promoter region is totally covered by transcription factors um, all the time. No room for any of the uh, you know, RNA polymerase machinery to get in there at all. Um, and really what this means is that this stuff alone does not, uh, does not have the predictive value that we need. All right. And you can't, so this is something that, that Wyeth, Wyeth Wasserman um, proposed, this so-called um, futility, futility conjecture. So this is um, Alvin Sandelin and Wyeth Wasserman in 2004. They called it the futility theorem back then, but futility conjecture is probably a better name for it. So, you know, where you have a binding site, transcription factor uh, binding site prediction will be right, but most of the transcription factor binding site predictions do not represent sites of, of biological relevance. Um, and increasing the stringency at which you apply these, these models um, does not help. All right, so it's not the it's not the case that we are just you know we aren't being strict enough about what we accept as a binding site. Um, if you start increasing the stringency, you're going to start throwing out a lot of the real binding sites as well. You'd be throwing out the um, the baby with the bathwater, so to speak. Um, so the problem the problem is that there are some more data that is essentially missing. There are other things that are going to affect whether transcription factor is really binding someplace or not than, than just a simple model of which sequences, um, which sequences exist there. Um, so let's sum up for the, the second part of this model. So position weight matrices, or PSSMs, accurately reflect the in vitro binding properties of of uh, DNA binding proteins, um, but they, these suitable binding sites occur far too often for us to make this a, a useful prediction of in vivo function. So we have to go to other methods to, to help us out. Are there any questions about this part of the module? All right, you guys are good. Um, so, one thing that we can do to move on to part three is we can talk, we can look at particular regions that we've already identified as, as regulatory. So I'm going to start um, by looking at discovery of transcription factor binding sites, discovery of novel binding sites, and then later we'll go into identifying binding sites that we already know about. So this is what we'll call the motif discovery problem. Let's say you have a number of genes that you know are, um, are co-regulated. So you know, or a number of sequences that you know have the same regulatory pathway. So you know this either from looking at gene expression data, so RNA-seq or microarray, and you find that some things are 
are well correlated together, or you know it by looking at chip seek, and you know that a bunch of regions are actually bound by the same transcription factor. The motif discovery problem is the problem of determining which, which motif, in this case, which PWM or PSSM, uh, will represent uh, a binding site that is common to many of these sites. Right? And in the previous example I gave you, right here, oh, I can't do that. So here, it's really easy to generate the PWM, right? Because everything's all, all nicely aligned in that column. Um, the problem in this case is that even though there's a common motif, they aren't going to be in the same column. So here we have sequence one. You know, we have these three uh, sites that look somewhat similar. These look like they might represent the same motif, um, but they all start at different sites within their region. Um, so we need to come up with a, another method of dealing with this. And there are another couple of problems to deal with. So the first problem is that the input sequences are really long. So even this example where, where I limited things to about 1,000 base pairs is maybe not necessarily realistic, especially considering that things can be affected by distal regulatory elements that are far away. And you'll have many thousands of examples of cases for something for, for each one of these motif discovery tasks. And also the motif can be very subtle. Uh, instances can be short. And again, the, the transcription factor binding sites can be degenerate. So let's do a, a brief example here. So we'll start with a set of promoter from co-regulated genes. All right, so here are um, six genes right here. Um, we've already flipped everything so that, you know, in reality, if you pick the average six genes, some of them will be on the plus strand, some of them will be on the minus strand. We're already looking at things in the context of the genes, um, the genes template strand. Um, so here are a set of promoters. So arbitrarily, we've decided we're going to look at uh, 100 base pairs upstream in, um, of the TSS in these, in these genes. Um, you know, if you were doing this as a real analysis, you would probably want to do something at least 500 base pairs. You know, usually people will do 2,000. Sometimes people will do 5,000. Those are sort of good rules of, of thumb when people are trying to do a very uh, quick um, attempt at defining what a, a promoter is. Um, so there's a transcription factor binding that binds to some positions that we don't know. And even though the, the genes are all um, arranged here um, on one strand, the transcription factor binding site can actually bind on either strand. So again, you know, we think of all of this as, or at least I think of all of this as, as information with an orientation, but within the cell, that's not really how things are. The cell is, the nucleus is a three-dimensional machine and, you know, if a transcription factor protein is one way or the other, you know, binding to one side of the, the major groove or the other, it doesn't really care. And it's probably still going to be able to uh, connect to other proteins in the transcription initiation machinery and make things happen no matter which way it's going. So we have to, we have to take the strand into account as well. All right. So here's the case. You've identified here, um, and, and I'll show you how this, you know, how we actually did this in a minute. But this, this is just showing you what we have to find. So here's a instance of the binding site. Here's another instance of the binding site. Here's an instance of the binding site in the reverse direction. So you know, it starts with here. We had one that started with A A A G. This one starts with T T C A C T. So it's the uh, you know, use the Watson uh, base pairing rules and, and reverse things. Um, all right, how are we going to come up with a PSSM that describes this? All right, here is one example. This is this is the simplest way I know of of, of doing this sort of thing is to use Gibbs sampling. Gibbs sampling 
uh, uses an approach that's quite common in machine learning, uh, which is a alternating approach. So somehow you start with an so you're trying to come up with some sort of set of parameters, right? So you're, you're trying to come up with parameters for a model. In this case, your model is which binding sites, which sequences um, does your transcription factor have affinity for. So we have a model, which is the PSSM. We want to come up with parameters, which are the values that go into the PSSM. So a simple way to do this is just to guess the parameters and to um, use those parameters to score the sequences that you have and see what's, what gets you the highest score. So this is even simpler than, than Gibbs sampling. We can just start with one and then two and does that give you a good score? We'll start with another random matrix. Do you want step one and then step, step two, does that give you a good score? You can do that thousands or millions of times, and maybe you will luck out and you will find something that actually gives you a good score for this particular region. If something does something that's a little bit more sophisticated, where instead of just re-guessing at the beginning, after you predict the instances and the input sequences, you then have a set of aligned binding sites, and then you can use those to uh, predict a new weight matrix using the, the original uh, PWM formula I showed you before. So it's a simple case of, you know, uh, starting, guessing at random, and then looking at the results, assuming you got the right results, refining your model, and then repeating the process again. So identifying results with the new refined model, right, and then using that to refine the model once more and then you repeat the process over and over again. And this works, this is a much more effective use of, it's of computation than, um, than just completely just guessing and starting from scratch each time. So I'll show you this, what I just described in some detail here. So we will guess an instance from each one of the input sequences. So just totally, totally random. We pick this, 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 and this. All right. And then we can, for, this, for the search part of this, we can throw away one of the, one of the instances. All right. So we picked five sequences here. We'll throw away sequence number four, for example. Um, and then we use the weight matrix to define instant probability at each position of, of that same input string. And we'll pick a new, um, a new region of the sequence for our next round. And we'll go through all of the individual sequences here, and we'll repeat the whole process over and over again. All right, so here's, here's this explained um, in yet another way. So here we've picked at random sequences one, two, three, and five. We picked four, two, but we've thrown it out here. All right, we feed that in to the general PSSM formula to produce this PSSM, and then we look at sequence four, we score all of the possible sequences, all the possible binding sites in sequence four, and then whatever is best, we feed that back into this, this starting matrix here. All right, so this is how the Gibbs sampler works. Um, a lot of what people use today um, is, is a um, software package called Meme, which uses something that is similar to the, the Gibbs sampler, um, except that it uses something called expectation maximization. Um, it still uses a sort of um, alternating approach. The difference is that instead of picking things at random, they use a method that allows them to try every possible um, every possible matrix that you could get out of a particular set of sequences. So Meme will give you the same answer every time you run it, um, and it can give you results that are as good as good sampling. Uh, Gibbs sampling could give you better results, uh, but you will, you will never know when you're done with Gibbs sampling. Uh, 
because you can keep running get sampling forever. You can always start with a new initial matrix um, and try something else. So, you know, meme can be um, much more satisfying um, in the aspect of, you know, having something where you, you know what the answer is going to be and you get the same answer each time. How are people doing with this? I know all of that, you know, that, that was probably some of the hairiest stuff we'll talk about in this particular module. So if people have, have questions, um, that is good. When do I stop? Oh, sure. The question is whether you have a transcription factor and it'll have some cooperative partner that might that might allosterically bind the transcription factor and change how it binds to DNA. Is that, is that the question? Yeah. So that's that's definitely a possibility. Um, so the way you deal with that in this sort of uh, PWM model is by having different PWMs for the cases where the transcription factor is affected by some other some other coactivator. So let me I think we'll use that as a jumping off project, jumping off point here. So here is the Jasper database that I that I told you about before. Um, and we can look at all of the different can look at all of the different different matrices that have been curated into Jasper. So you find a number that are you know, transcription factors, F1, X1, you know, pretty much any well-defined transcription factor uh, included here. Right. But you also find things, zoom in here. You find things like this. So this guy, DDIT3, CBPA. Those are two transcription factors, all right? And the the two colons is a way of saying that this is this is the uh, position weight matrix that is associated with these two working together. Now, do we know, you know, from this, like, is CBPA or DDIT3, which one is actually contacting the DNA? No, we don't know. From the purpose of just trying to model transcription factor binding sites, it doesn't really matter. It's it's convenient to think of them as a single entity. Now, this is a really crude way of doing this. Um, so you can think of um, you know models that might be more sophisticated that would include you know like a PWM where you have a you have like an extra variable and use some sort of graphical model to to control um, different probabilities being emitted, but, you know, someone would have to develop all of that stuff, and it would, you know, uh, be kind of a fun project for someone who's interested in the computer science of, of computational biology, but in the end, you don't know whether you would get results that are actually more biologically useful or not. Did you have a question also? The question was when you stop sampling. Oh, that's right. Oh. Um, so like I said, this sort of alternating approach is very common in machine learning. And that problem of when you stop sampling is, is equally common. Um, and you basically have to define some sort of arbitrary uh, stopping point. Um, so, you know, in this case, what you might do is you might keep repeating this, this process until your score stops increasing, all right? So you start with a you start with a new random set, and you go through all of this. And at a certain point, uh, the Gibbs sampler will stop in increasing the score by very much. And at a certain point, if you throw out the results and you start over again and write Gibbs sampling on a number of new initial matrices, they won't outperform your your previous score. 
so, you know, if you do something like, you know, you try a thousand new matrices after you, you start one that, uh, if you found one with a score over a certain threshold, you know, then you start a thousand new matrices. And if you haven't found any that perform better after a thousand, then you're good. Or you can do, you know, a million. Uh, there's always there's always more to do though, which is which is kind of a problem with these sorts of methods. They they don't guarantee a closed form solution. Any other questions? Those are really good questions. Um, things that people who uh, write these methods should perhaps think about at the beginning of the method rather than at the end. All right. So once you've discovered a matrix, so you get um, so out of, out of running something like meme or a Gibb sampler or a dream or something similar, um, you will get a motif, right? Um, and often we have so many matrices in Jasper, so many motifs that have been identified already. Um, it can be really helpful to, to ask the question, does my discovered motif match up with something that's already in Jasper or in TransFat? And you can use a tool called TomTom, Tom, which is part of the meme suite, to do exactly that. So it's very simple. You just you paste in a PSSM. It compares against Jasper um, or TransFact, and it gives you an alignment, not of sequences like Blast, but instead an alignment of one motif to another. I mean, it is rather similar to Blast in that you, you get a p-value, you get a, a e-value or expect value. Um, you know, things are are corrected for multiple multiple comparisons. Um, and this can be useful for two reasons. One, you might have found just a new, you know, another instance of a transcription factor that's already known. But, I mean, you might have found a, a novel transcription factor, but it's something that's similar to one of the transcription factors people already know about. You know, this is something that's quite common because these transcription factors will arise in evolution by a process of duplication and, and substitution. Um, and so you'll end up with something that even if the amino acid sequence of the transcription factors are very different, they will have a very similar uh, recognition motif. All right. So that is the end of part three of this. Um, so part four um, is where we talk about inferring which transcription factors regulate sets of, sets of genes. So for this, um, we can start with um, information we have from some sort of um, gene expression experiment. All right, so here we have microarray. It can be RNA-seq as well or instead. As a computational biologist, you know, when I, when I look at something like this, what it represents to me is, you know, knowledge of which genes are co-expressed. So which genes uh, do you find that have high expression or correlated expression within the same, um, the same uh, cellular uh, environment? Um, and you also get a set of negative controls um, that do not have this, this same sort of expression. All right. And we have a particular motif that we want to use to interrogate these regions of, of co-expressed and negative controls, co-expressed sequences and negative controls. Um, and we need to get a method that will say this particular binding site is present at all of these co Express genes, um, and you don't find it in any of the, the negative controls. So there are a couple of ways you can do this. Um, you can do this either by um, doing a de novo discovery of what's occurring in the co-expressed versus the negative controls, which is what's done by DREAM. But a simpler way is to look at the set of uh, binding motifs that we already have in Jasper and to scan both, both of these sets with Jasper using software like Schema. All right. Um, so this is, you know, in some ways very similar to um, looking for go-term enrichment, 
Did you guys talk about GoTerm enrichment earlier today? Okay. Um, so it's similar to that, but instead of looking for a particular um, GoTerm, you are looking for a particular transcription factor binding motif that occurs over and over again. Right. So there are a couple of different ways to measure enrichment. So here is one way. Um, looking at so a particular binding site, and here are genes that are co-regulated, and here are negative controls, or the background, and we'll find that this binding site occurs in 100% of the genes in the foreground, or the co-regulated genes, and zero times in the background. All right, so um, a clear case of enrichment here. Another thing you can look at is the number of binding sites. All right, so here we might find a uh, motif that you find in the negative controls, but you find it many more times in the positive controls. Those are both, both good ways of, of looking at this problem, and there are a couple of different statistical techniques that you can use to identify them. Um, so one way is you can use a binomial test, which will give you a, a z-score, um, and that will give you um, an answer based on the number of occurrences of the transcription factor binding site relative to the background, and you'll be able to use that to get a, a p-value. Um, you can also use a method based on uh, Fisher's exact test, um, and that will be based on the number of genes containing it instead of the number of occurrences uh, within the genes. So again, this is the case where we have genes, this is the case where we have occurrences or instances being compared. So there is, um, there is a piece of software called Opossum, which is uh, created by Wyeth Wasserman's um, lab at UBC, um, and it will do just this for you. So you feed in a set of co-expressed genes from your experiment. Um, it will... Uh, so, so you can just feed in gene IDs. It will get the sequence from uh, on the Ensemble database. Um, you can optionally do phylogenetic profiling, uh, excuse me, phylogenetic footprinting, um, and it will detect transcription factor binding sites and give you the statistical significance of those binding sites by either one of these two methods. So... Phylogenetic profiling is, is something I haven't really gone into here. Um, it was in a previous version of this, this lecture, but I've taken it out. Um, phylogenetic profiling is a way of looking at sequences across many different related genomes. Right? So one, um, one inference you might make is that if something is a real important transcription factor binding site of biological relevance, you might expect to find it in, um, in human, but you also expect to find a similar binding site um, aligned to the same region in, in mouse and in rat and in dog um, and in all sorts of other related species. So this can be a way of limiting to areas where you find more evidence for the the biologically relevant binding site than just the PWM score. Um, I don't actually like doing this anymore because a lot of what people have found is that there are real binding sites where you won't find a phylogenetic footprint, right? So a lot of times evolution acts differently on regulatory sequence than it does on protein coding sequence. And even though sometimes you will find um, you know, that a site is conserved, like let's say you have a, um, let's say you have a, a, a mixed site in, in, some particular, in some particular promoter, right? So you might find the mixed site, so you have a mixed site, and then we have an SP1 site, right? So if you look in human, you've got MIC, and you've got SP1. If you look in mouse, you might find the order of these is reversed. This will fail any sort of analysis that is designed to find an alignment between these two species because the order has gotten mixed up. Um, yet they retain their uh, their function in terms of 
of causing the gene to, ha to exist within a particular regulatory program. Um, so phylogenetic footprinting can be useful, but I think, you know, it's, I think of it as something very stringent, and when you use phylogenetic footprinting, you can often expect to have um, a lot of false negatives. All right. Oh, another question. Yes, please go ahead. <laughs> no, a, a possum will actually uh, do all of this. Yeah. So, um, I believe, Veronique, is the integrated lab going to cover a possum? Are you using it? Yeah. So, you will have, um, after dinner, a chance to use a possum yourself, um, and it should do all of that. So, it, it makes this a lot, um, a lot easier for you. Other questions? Okay. So, um, the people who um, created opossum uh, did some amount of, of validation. So they took some, um, some gene sets um, that they knew were either muscle specific. So they did some some expression gene expression experiments in muscle muscle tissue and some in liver tissue, right? and then they tried to identify. Um, transcription factor motifs that were overrepresented or that were enriched in the genes that are co-regulated in muscle or in liver. All right, and here you can see the results of this. So opossum said that the, the, the transcription factor motifs that came up most often for this muscle data were SRF, MEF2, CMIV, MIF, and, and TEF1. Um, so many of these are known to be muscle-related, and there have also been um, other experiments where people have verified that the transcription factors actually bind to these regions within the reference sets. And they did something very similar um, with liver. So the opossum server, if you, uh, there's not a direct link from that wiki page, but this is what it will look like. and. You can do all sorts of uh, different analyses, either by looking in a set of genes or by looking for um, combinations of transcription factors, which I think goes to your, your question earlier. You can, you know, find whether there are particular sets of, you know, pairs or triplets of, of transcription factors that occur together. All right. So there's... In terms of structure of the uh, transcription factors, so there have been solved structures in PDB for a lot of different transcription factors. And most of the time, um, a transcription factor with a similar three-dimensional fold will have highly, highly similar uh, DNA sequences. So let's look at this. Um, this ETS transcription factor here, I mentioned this um, a little earlier, um, that you can find similar transcription factors that have similar binding motifs. So this, this uh, motif is for a core ETS transcription factor binding site, but there are a variety of different proteins um, that can bind to um, that binding site. All right, so here's a list of transcription factors in the ETS family. Um, so as you can see, there's a couple of dozen of them. Um, so all of these, or almost all of them, will, will return a good match using uh, the sort of PSSM scoring scheme we talked about earlier. So when you want to discriminate between different examples of things like this, it's important to use um, some other software. So there's software called Popgene that uh, um, approaches that very problem. It will look at similar transcription factor binding sites and tell you what the, the best one um, of all of these for a particular 
attach of sequences. Are there any questions on this part of the talk? Yeah. Well, I believe what I believe you need um, to have a um, set of co-regulated genes and also um, a set of background genes. Uh, oh, that's not good. <laughs> if I'm on the right page, that that's really helpful. Isn't this the page I was just on? I hope they fix it often by a uh, by time for your your lab. It was different than the picture. Well, here's here's another one of the combination side analysis. Okay, thank you for noticing that. Um, so you can do single side analysis here, and you know this is the set of genes. So you you know. And gene IDs, I think actually they'll want different kinds of gene IDs than that. Um, for your co expressed genes, and then you know, for the background, you can either use all genes or all other genes, or you can choose to put in a set that you know are not in the um, not in the experimental set, the positive, positive set. So you have your choice. You can you can specify it or not. I believe it only it only processes a gene list, so I don't think it uh, at least this version of it, and I don't think the other versions do either. So yeah, the input is pretty crude. It, it wants a gene list. All right. So finally, we will go to the last section of this, which is uh, gene regulatory networks, um, and. Goal um, is to be able to predict regulatory regions um, in uh, a given. Oh, this is the wrong URL. Oh well, given cell or tissue based on uh, integrative analysis of, of diverse genome scale data. All right, so I'll give you an example here, uh, which is of Segway, which is a piece of software produced uh, by my lab. So Segway takes um, data from things like ChIP-seq and DNA-seq um, and uses them to segment the genome into subclasses, right? So you can take um, observations about the epigenetic state of particular parts of the genome, and you can use those to say this region is something that appears to be regulatory, this looks like a distal enhancer region, this looks like a transcription start site, and so on and so forth. This can be very useful, you know, as an additional way of determining where transcriptional regulatory activity is real. So I think this is the um, approach that is, that is favored over using say, phylogenetic profiling, or excuse me, phylogenetic footprint, footprinting these days um, is looking at data from ENCODE or roadmap epigenomics and identifying a priori a region as regulatory and then looking for transcription factor binding sites. You know, that will tell you about the way chromatin is shaped in three, dimensional, in three dimensions and will allow you to say this is a region um, where the transcription factor uh, transcription factors are likely to be able to get access to the DNA. If often the chromatin is coiled around itself tightly enough um, in case of heterochromatin that transcription factor machinery simply can't get access. Sometimes there, it, that won't happen, but you'll have nucleosomes in the way. So, you know, these sorts of other data sets can be very helpful in figuring this out. Um, 
Another tool that you guys should be aware about is called GREAT. Um, so GREAT is something from the Bejarano lab at, at Stanford. Um, and it is kind of a combination of uh, um, the tools that we use to analyze non-coding and regulatory regions and the sort of gene set enrichment analysis that you talked about earlier today. So what GREAT does is it takes um, regulatory regions that you've identified with some other method, um, and so you can take a bed file, which is a, a simple representation of regions in the genome, and will tell you what sort of genes are nearby. All right. So here we can see this uh, output where we took we took some regulatory regions and we asked it which are what the function of nearby genes are. In this case, the nearby genes need to be associated with interferon signaling, hypoxia, and oxygen homeostasis, and, and various other sorts of things. Um, so that can be very useful if you have a very particular kind of data set. Uh, yeah. I mean, so most of what it, yeah, I think it should work. Uh, you know, most of what it does is it looks for the nearest gene. Um, so, you know, if you have something in coding sequence, I think, I think it should identify it as being within the gene. Uh, you know, again, the important thing to remember about, you know, from a transcription factor's point of view, like, it doesn't necessarily see the, the genome as divided into coding sequence and non-coding sequence. So something that tracks a transcription factor could very much, you know, not only be in the first exon, sorry, first intron, but might also be stuff occurring within the first exon. Uh, sometimes the, the transcriptional machinery itself will get in the way and then and that won't happen. But, you know, I think it's, it's important not, you know, not necessarily to, to um, disregard coding coding regions as regions that aren't going to affect the regulation. They, they definitely do in some cases. Is there another question? Okay. So as I showed you, you know, there was that top, op top option in opossum to look at um, single site analysis. Um, and then there was the next option, which is combined set analysis. Um, and that is a way of looking at which transcription factor binding sites um, co-occur. Um, so another way is, you know, the fact that people have identified some of these um, these co-binding complexes that I identified before, um, but sometimes it won't affect. It won't actually affect the PDOM of either case. They just happen to. Uh, bind near each other. And so a possum can find that. There's something in the meme suite which is called SPAMO, which will find that as well. Um, this SPA part uh, means spacing. So it's it's a tool for motif spacing, um, and it's something that you can use to find pairs of motifs that occur nearby each other. So if you look in a big in a site and you find that usually you find you know these two motifs, you find these motifs these two motifs all over the all over the time, and you find them 19 base pairs um, apart from each other. And SPAMO can tell you that this is something that's actually statistically significant. That's something you might want to consider. You know, are these two motifs in some sort of larger complex? So there are a lot of um, big challenges ahead in understanding. Um, transcriptional regulation better, um, where, you know, if you look at something like JASPER, the number of transcription factors is actually still quite small. The number of transcription factors humans are believed to have is something between 1,400 and 2,000, and we're still, you know, looking at hundreds of transcription factors. In ChIP-seq data we have, you know, in the human K562 cell type, we have hundreds of transcription factors. There are various numbers of various groups in Canada and the U.S. that are trying to attack this problem of getting all of the transcription factors. 
Um, I think this will be very worthwhile once it happens. But until then, we have to deal with the fact that we have a limited uh, limited stat to look at. Um, people are trying to understand the impact of genetic variation on, on these transcription factor binding sites as well. So sometimes you have quite, if you have a region of the, um, of the binding site that's very high information, has a really high letter in the sequence logo, that's something that can be you know, very important for the regulation of the gene. Um, if that changes via a mutation, whether in the course of evolution or in the course of a cancer, people are trying to figure out how that will affect the, the binding model. You know, will it cause one transcription factor to disappear and another one to appear? People are still trying to develop good models um, to answer that question. So integration of data sources, you know, the thing I mentioned earlier where you can look at the results of something like Segway and you can use that to predefine a region of the genome as being regulatory. People have used other approaches like phylogenetic uh, footprinting where they predefine a region as regulatory because it is conserved across evolution. You know, those are both fairly crude ways of doing this and people are trying to come up with ways where they can incorporate all of the information we have about the chromatin state of a particular region and maybe the evolution evolutionary state, the population state of a particular region and try to figure out um, you know, if we can make better models of how the transcription factor is providing. And finally, um, you know, I showed you earlier how you can go from a, a crude model of, um, of transcription factor motif using IUPAC ambiguous characters to a more sophisticated one using a PSSM. Um, but that in its way is can still be crude as well. Because okay? one of the things about the PSSM is all of the columns are independent. And in reality, this may not fit what's really happening. Um, so it's quite likely, and I think people have actually shown, that you know if you have one nucle nucleotide uh, bound in one column of a transcription factors motif, that will affect what nucleotides are going to bind at the next column. That's something that's totally disregarded of this, this model and is something that I think people are, are thinking about how to fix. So we'll go back to this, um, this three-dimensional picture of what's actually happening in the nucleus. Um, there's you know, a lot we've learned over the, the past couple of decades about how individual transcription factors bind to particular DNA sequences. But that context um, that can be all important in distinguishing the relevant, biologically important transcription factors, binding sites, from the ones that actually don't end up occurring in vivo or even in vitro, sort of in silico only binding sites is something that is that is still somewhat elusive. Uh, but people are, you know, starting to get better and better mo better better models of chromatin. You know, people are starting to understand with techniques like 3C, 5C, and high C how distal regions of the genome are tied to each other. People are starting to understand how distal enhancers are linked to proximal regions of the genome. And, you know, both where um, histone modifications occur that might, might regula mark regulatory sequence, as well as people are trying, people are learning how to determine where those histone modifications are occurring based on the sequence alone. So, you know, this is a, a complicated hairball of a problem, but there are, you know, many groups working on different aspects of this, and I'm hoping that things are going to, you know, become as much better in the next five years as they, they have been in the previous five years. Um, so I'm going to, to sum up on the, the lecture part here. Um, you know, I've told you a lot of different ways of looking at transcription factor binding sites. 
but I think the most important thing to uh, remember is this futility conjecture. Um, you know, just because you find one, it might not it might not really be something you're you're interested in. So it's always important to use the results of these, you know, as hypotheses, you know, as things that you further confirm with other methods rather than, you know, doing a binding site prediction and, and stopping, saying that's your, your conclusion. Um, it's really something that is used for discovery rather than confirmation of a hypothesis. Um, the final thing, I'll skip most of this, but the, the final thing that I think, you know, should reiterate is that one of the best um, data sources for this sort of additional confirmation is the data you can get from ChipSeq, from, you know, results of projects like the ENCODE project, like um, Roadmap Epigenomics. Um, these are things that will will tell you more than just this, um, the sequence happens to fit a particular PWM. And they're the things that tell you about this crucial chromatin context that's important in understanding uh, where transcription factor binding sites occur. So I think I'm going to stop there. Uh, do people have any any questions at this point? Yeah. So we find that a lot of what's missing in the model that's preventing us from being actually I don't think I I don't feel like we're at a loss. I feel like they're just uh, you know parts of the model that people are, are actively working on, um, and that. So, you know, basically, for a long time, people have had this, this, you know, what I think of as the, you know, the big problem in uh, bioinformatics of, of gene regulation, uh, which is you have sequence, you have some information about a particular um, cell type or tissue type, and how do you figure out uh, which genes are going to be expressed, all right? The problem of which, which transcription factor binding sites are going to at attract real honest-to-God transcription factors, I think, is a subset of that problem. Um, and for a long time, I think much of this has been kind of a, a black box. You know, sometimes the binding sites are there, sometimes the binding sites are not there, and, you know, who knows? Let's look and see whether the binding sites are... Um, they are across evolution. It's only been within the past couple of years that we've had, you know, other data sources that we can rely on. So this is, oh, came to the wrong section. So, you know, one of the, the focuses of, of my lab is understanding this problem. So I like to look at it this way. You know, for a long time, we've, you know, we've had the sequence, and we wanted to guess where RNA is. Sometimes we want to guess where transcription factors are binding. There are all of these other variables that are important in understanding that, where the epigenetic modifications are, where chromatin remodelers are, what the structure of the chromatin is. You know, is the chromatin packed tightly? Are there well-positioned nucleosomes here or there? Hey, we're finally starting to get lots and lots of data on these questions, and you know that is that makes it much more likely that we'll be able to get a uh, complete model. Before we just had no idea. So even if we wanted to create something that had a model of all that stuff, it would have all been a total guess and would have been totally intractable for for a computer to figure out. Um, and I think as high throughput experimental techniques improve, we'll get more and more data that. Uh, people like the, you know, people in my group will be able to incorporate that into these models and, and improve them. I mean, you know, computational complexity, you know, it's, it, I, I should clarify, it's not a problem of, you know, finding an algorithm that's fast enough. Like, you know, people still don't have the model that that works. Um, and I think that's the main problem, which is, you know, 
imagining a model that will incorporate all of these different sorts of data well. Uh, and people, people are making stabs at this, and people are doing, you know, better and better jobs at this sort of thing each year. Uh, but I, I feel like there's still a long way to go, and uh, it's not like people are just trying to eke out a small bit of performance either in computer time or in prediction, predictive ability. They have a lot they can do. And the other thing is people keep inventing new experimental techniques that we can use as, as raw data for this sort of stuff. The things that were, you know, previously unimaginable, you know, now we have um, large-scale data sets that include them. Other questions? Okay. Well, should we start with our, our coffee break now, then, in that case? Um, and should we go back at... at 3.30 and get back to the original. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, have enjoy your break. If you have any other questions, I will be around here. Um, and I will still be here at 3.30 and we will talk about the lab for this session. Thanks, guys.